next on Outdoor Journal. We spend a day at a couple of biological deer check stations during youth weekend and learn why they are so important to biologists and deer management. 20 and 23. Then we visit the Maquam Wildlife Management Area. This WMA has a rich history and it supports a rich diversity of wildlife thanks to ongoing habitat work. We also take a walk in the woods to learn what landowners can do to provide habitat for deer and other wildlife. This program has been made possible by a generous grant from the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, conserving our fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for all Vermonters to enjoy. There we go. Nice shot. For years, managing deer in Vermont was as simple as protecting does, which allowed deer to recover after being wiped out in the 1800s. But as the herd grew, deer management evolved. Today it's all about taking just the right amount of does to keep populations at desired levels. Determining how many antlerless permits to issue is a complex process that factors in past harvests, winter weather, and a host of biological data much of which is provided by the deer themselves with the help of Vermont's next generation of hunters. That's a beautiful buck. Yep, take a picture of it. 186 with a heart, liver, and lungs. Every November during Vermont's youth deer hunting season, check stations across the state are filled with smiling kids and proud parents. Deer are reported, stories shared, and photos taken. But at a handful of check stations, a lot more goes on. 20 and 23. Since 1963, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department has annually operated special biological check stations to gather the data needed to monitor the health of the deer herd. This information and other data help state biologists determine science-driven management strategies. Where would you hit the deer that, uh, that brought him down? Oh, in the back. Is it exciting? Were you excited? We have 17 biological check stations in the state. And when we get a youth in, first of all, we congratulate them on getting a deer. This is a big thing. Often it's the first deer that they've got, and it's a celebration. And we want them to know what's special about a biological check station, why we're there, and why they're playing an important role in wildlife management. Uh, we're gonna use a diameter tape to measure the antler beam diameter and it's something the biologists have been doing since the 1940s. Basically when the yearling antler beam diameters are wide the herd's real healthy and when the herd doesn't have enough food to eat because you got too many deer the antler beams shrink. That one's 17 millimeters across which is a good a good diameter. Biological check stations were operated for decades during the opening weekend of the rifle season. Because of the antler restrictions that were introduced in 2005, the stations were moved to the Youth Deer Weekend, which is now the only season when any buck is legal game. This allows biologists to compare current data with information collected before 2005, when yearling bucks with spike antlers could still be harvested during rifle season. During the 2010 Youth Weekend, we visited two biological check stations, at Wright's Enterprises in Newport, and St. Marie's Deli and Quick Stop in Swanton. When a youth first comes into this check station, uh, the first thing we do is to ask them to see their license. We get all the information dealing with location and everything, and the last thing we do is take some biological characteristics of the deer. That's what we're actually there for. And the first thing we do is we uh, use a, a jaw spreader so that we can access the teeth. We do a visual examination and actually get an estimate of the age. So the first thing we look at is that third premolar. And I can see that it's got some wear, so I know she's not a yearling. So my best guess would be two and a half. To confirm their estimates of each deer's age, biologists extract a tooth, one of the central incisors, and send it to a lab. 
where the tooth is cut and rings in the cross section are counted like rings in a tree to accurately age the deer. 135, clean. Every deer that is brought into a check station is also weighed. If an antlered buck, the diameter of the beam or base of each antler is also measured. Uh, four points, 19 and 20 for the beam. The data obtained at biological check stations is just one piece of a complex puzzle. State game wardens also collect biological data from road-killed deer, particularly does that are killed in the late winter and spring. They're looking at the amount of uh, fetuses that a doe might have. So we get the reproductive potential of a herd actually from, from looking at uh, roadkill. We actually canvas and send out surveys to hunters as well on sighting rates of deer, on how many deer they see per hour hunting in different areas of the state. And all these indices get together to give us an idea of population size and, and health of, of the deer in each area. One of the most important but least predictable factors that affects the deer herd is the winter severity index. Throughout the state, all the biologists and a lot of foresters are asked to take recordings on snow depth and cold. And a point is given for any day that it's zero or below uh, at any point during the day and also on days that it's 18 inches or snow or more in depth. 18 inches is a proximate depth that really restricts the travel of deer. They have to be in deer wintering areas. They can't go throughout their range and find food throughout their range like they normally would. We know that food's very restricted once it reaches that snow depth. So you can get actually two points per day. The statewide winter severity index is about 50 points during an average winter. This can vary greatly from year to year, however, as well as from one wildlife management unit to another. Snow depths and temperatures can vary widely in different parts of the state. A hard winter can impact the deer herd by causing increased winter mortality. This and other information is taken into consideration when it comes to allocating antlerless deer permits each year. One of the most controversial things we do, but it's also one of the most important in deer management, is the setting of antlerless permits. And those are, are given out during the muzzleloader season. That's the tool we have for controlling the re reproductive power of the herd, how many does are out there. And the setting of those permits is based a lot on the previous year's harvest and those sighting surveys and all the different parameters that we've collected through the year. And we look at whether or not the deer population is above objective or not and how many deer we want to take for the coming year to make sure the deer are below the biological carrying capacity and they're right in the objective range for the population. Simply seeing a deer in Vermont was big news not too long ago. Deer were wiped out by the mid-1800s, primarily due to the loss of habitat, and the first modern hunting season was not held until 1897. For many years, all hunting was for bucks only. As the herd steadily grew, deer management strategies had to evolve. For decades, we had a management theme that was just in growing the population. And to do that, we allowed only one deer to be taken and a buck only. When you're harvesting only bucks, your population should increase dramatically under that kind of management scenario. And we did that in Vermont all the way up through the 1960s. And we actually were almost too successful. At that point, we realized that, that the population had been so great that it had surpassed the biological carrying capacity of the land. The habitat was degraded, the deer were small, the antlers were smaller, and the deer wintering areas were, didn't have the capacity, they were over browsed to have that many deer. And when we had a fairly severe winter, then we had large numbers of deer die and there was a very boom and bust cycles then of the deer population. The question was, uh, do we have any figures or estimates on mortality other than winter? Biological information plays a major role in devising deer management strategies, but public opinion is also a factor. Fish and Wildlife holds deer hearings every spring to provide updates on the previous fall's harvest and the overall health of the herd. The meetings also give the public an opportunity to weigh in with their comments. And it's not just hunters who have concerns about Vermont's deer herd. Part of the changes in management 
that we've seen is now we're hearing from our other constituents. The landowners and foresters especially are stepping forward and saying what they feel is, is too many deer. If it's hurting their livelihood, they're speaking up and letting us know. We're trying to be responsive to all the different constituents that we have out there. Successfully managing deer requires a vibrant hunting community. One of the challenges facing wildlife managers today is getting the next generation of hunters in the woods. One part of deer management that we're concerned about now is the participation of our young people in hunting. That has declined through the years and we're trying to address that in every way we can. We have a youth deer season as well as turkey and waterfowl hunts, especially for youth, uh, to try to get them out, to make it special, to make sure they're mentored and that it's a, a good time for them and hopefully that they'll take up hunting as a, as a sport themselves. At our check stations, we also give out actually shoulder patches for them participating in a biological check station and it's very well received. The, the kids actually like these patches. You see them wearing them later and things like that. Their parents will often drive by a regular check station just to come into one of those biological check stations we've, we've got. We're really happy about that. For all of us right now, it's a wonderful time to be a hunter and we really want to try to express that and make sure that our, our youth know that. There's never been more opportunities for hunting in the state than we have right now. And it, it's just a wonderful time. Hunting is good right now. It's a wonderful time period to be a hunter in Vermont. Nestled in the northwestern corner of Vermont, the 872-acre Maquam Wildlife Management Area is nearly split in half by Route 36. The southern half, or Lampman portion, is mostly woodlands, while the northern half, or Maquam Bay side, borders Lake Champlain. Maquam Wildlife Management Area is up in Swanton, and it has both uh, lakeshore swampy habitat and the Lampman unit where we are now is a little bit drier site. Um, you can easily walk around uh, this part of the WMA. The Maquam Bay is usually boat or canoe only because uh, it's basically part of Lake Champlain. It's got a lot of flooded uh, button bush swamp, very productive wetland marsh for wildlife, so waterfowl and fishing are two of the main recreations in Maquam Bay. The Lampman portion of the WMA is mostly upland forest. It's managed for an array of wildlife that depends on young forest habitat. We do a lot of aspen management here. It's a very uh, large area of aspen forest, which is one of the prime food and cover forest types for rough grouse and woodcock. We do a lot of small openings for deer browse and, and some of the ash and the soft maple stands here. We're trying to promote the food um, here that deer like. We also do a lot of mowing in the summertime. We try to, there's a lot of small fields in here as part of the old uh, pasture that was here a long time ago, 30, 40 years ago. And we try to keep meadows open for woodcock, for singing, but for a lot of songbirds like yellow throats and and yellow warblers that sort of like that kind of open brushy habitat. A variety of wildlife species benefit from the management that takes place on the Maquam WMA. The wetland portion is great for spotting waterfowl, wading birds, and aquatic mammals like beaver, muskrat, and river otters. The early successional habitat is great for grouse and woodcock. Adjacent farmland and hardwoods attract turkey, deer, and a host of other popular wildlife species. When we bought the property back in 1994, um, the land trust came in and bought an easement, the development rights off the property, because it was about to be developed by the, the former landowner. The local Abnecki were concerned about that because there are historical issues here, and uh, we all kind of worked together with the land trust and the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board to acquire the easements, which allowed us to buy the property. Every time we do a timber sale, we work with the land trust and with the local Abnaki trying to protect historic resources on the property, and it's been a partnership that's worked very well. One tree species that is never cut on the Maquam WMA is black ash. These trees are used for traditional basket making by the Abnaki. The land that makes up the wildlife management area has been important to the Abnaki for centuries and it continues to hold special significance today. 
In fact, the word maquam means beaver in the Algonquin language. In the 19th century, there was a, an Abnaki woman that was born and raised here. Uh, her name was Grandma Lantman, was, was what she was locally known as, but a very well-liked um, woman in the area. And this property was very important to the descendants of Grandma Lantman. They were instrumental in helping the state conserve this property. And in doing so, we established that plaque for her to sort of recognize her contribution to the local Swanton area. Few things are more satisfying for landowners than seeing deer, wild turkeys, and other wildlife on their property. And few things are more important to deer and other wildlife than engaged landowners. About 80% of Vermont's forested habitat is privately owned, and as more land is lost in development each year, the importance of the remaining habitat has steadily grown. With the help of organizations like the Vermont Woodlands Association, the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department is able to host workshops that educate landowners on the benefits of actively managing wildlife habitat. This is our deer yard. If you were to look around here, and think of a deer which browses at about head height and below, grabbing little nips of buds and twigs, there's not a lot of forage here. And if you're a deer in the wintertime, they roughly want about four to six pounds of woody browse a day. By putting these small patch cuts in here and there, directly adjacent good cover, you get that browse with minimal impacts to the deer yard and it helps the deer herd survive out there. On a snowy January day, Dave Adams, a wildlife biologist with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, led a walk in the woods program to educate landowners about managing their property for deer and other wildlife. The demonstration property, owned by Cheryl Vreeland and Gilbert Patno, is in Fletcher, Vermont. It used to be an old farm. It was uh, 210 acres originally, and 65 acres got broken off, and my family bought it uh, back in the 60s. And my dad always wanted to keep it together, and uh, I did too, and I kind of picked up on his dream. I always thought it was a kind of a special place. It's got softwood, hardwood mix, and open fields that we hay, and then uh, old pasture land, which uh, is basically what we're turning into wildlife habitat. The half-day workshop, which was sponsored by the Vermont Woodlands Association, is a way to showcase what individual landowners can do to maintain and even enhance wildlife habitat. Vermont Woodlands Association is the voice of private forestry in the state of Vermont. As such, the organization represents private woodland owners and is engaged in educating private woodland owners in how to manage their land sustainably for a variety of resources and uh, landowner objectives. Quality versus quantity. Find the best trees you've got and make them even better. We're out here today on the Vreeland property to discuss deer habitat, deer management, because this property's got a mix of everything we really want. They've got a nice 40 plus acre deer yard in the back here. They've got open agricultural fields. They've got some woodlot management that they're doing. They've got some apple tree release, old field management that they're doing over here. So we're out here today discussing all of the stuff that the private landowner can do under the, the different technical assistance programs to really meet their fish, wildlife, and forestry goals on their property. One of those programs is the Wildlife Habitat Incentive, or WIP program. It's a federal program that will fund up to 75% of the costs of certain habitat improvements. This includes the costs of seed and trees, as well as equipment and the landowner's time. The Natural Resources Conservation Service, in conjunction with Vermont Fish and Wildlife, will also provide landowners with technical assistance. It's not like you're going to get rich off of it. It, it just helps out with the, with the price of gas and oil for your chainsaw and, and running your tractor. And, but it's well worth it because of what you learn, you know, how to properly release trees and, and what to keep. Because that's something we didn't even know, what, which trees, you know, like oak and cherry and uh, even hardack to keep that. And thorn apple trees, we've been cutting them and burning them. And he said, and they said that's the best tree to have for the deer is thorn apples. So it's, it, to me, it's well worth it. It's, you know, I've been very happy so far. During the three-hour hike through the property, 
Everything from managing deer wintering areas to enhancing various food sources was covered. This is where we're going to begin to favor our mass producing trees. We've got a beautiful oak right here, but he's in direct competition with some ash. We do have a hard hack, which is a, a nice mass producer as well. But in this case, my oak is a lot more important. So I'm going to take these guys out to reduce the stress, get this canopy to fill out. In a few years, this tree will begin to throw more nuts. And this is actually a nice acorn ridge that we've got here. As you can see, we've got some pretty nice, big mass producing trees. The WIP program is designed to maintain, enhance, or create important habitats. This is excellent. This looks excellent in here. Another focus on the Vreeland property is releasing apple trees that are now in old, overgrown pasture, which also creates an immediate food source for deer in the form of down limbs. If you look down at all this ash, there's browse on here. The deer are coming out of the woods. That chainsaw is like ringing the dinner bell to them. They're coming out. They're browsing here. They're going to eat these apples, as you can see. Hopefully next year, the production is tenfold what we've got right now. Uh, again, really the Establishing young forest cover or early successional habitat then, then benefits everything from shrubland birds like grouse, woodcock, and many songbirds to deer, turkey, moose, and bear. The more diverse the habitat, the more diverse the wildlife that calls it home. Part of the walk also stressed the importance of controlling invasive plants. Right here, we've got honeysuckle. It has no value, and that's the misconception. Oh, it's got a berry on it. The birds love it. Of course they love it. We love Doritos. I love Doritos. It is a good berry, but it's again, it's not good for the wildlife. The value of most invasive plants for wildlife is far less than what is provided by native species. While the eradication of invasives would be ideal, the focus is on the more realistic goals of containment and control. So identification of these, if you've got them, and early removal. You want to treat them in August when the nutrients are moving away from the, the leaves back to the root. You put a concentrated Roundup or a chemical on it and it sucks it in, kills it dead. Cutting these stems just without treating them creates tenfold of a problem because they stump sprout. They stump sprout incredibly vigorously and that means you've got, instead of two stems, 15 stems. The walk in the woods at the Reeland property showcased a good mix of possible wildlife habitat improvement projects. The typical private landowner enrolled in WIP has less than 100 acres, but regardless of the extent of their property, all the participants want to be good stewards of their land. The best way to do so is to develop both a forest and a wildlife management plan. Uh, private woodland owners have a variety of ownership objectives. Wildlife is a very popular one. And so it's one that we, we deal with quite a bit. But the bottom line is that a, a landowner has to be able to afford to hold their property and pay their taxes. So income is often generated either through such things as maple syrup production or timber production. And so we focus on those objectives as well. Because the important thing for Vermont, uh, the people who live here and the people who visit here, is to have a sustainable forest base. And that can only come from being able to uh, maintain the property and pay the taxes and, and meet your obligations as a landowner. As a result of their habitat work, Cheryl and Gilbert have generated a source of firewood as well as quality lumber for Gilbert's carpentry. A win-win situation for both the landowner and wildlife, as evidenced by all the deer signs scattered throughout the property. We've got a great example of habitat success Nice buck rub on a piece of property. We've been doing some habitat management. You know, when you do cut some trees, create some habitat, the animals come in, and that's just pure evidence that, hey, the habitat out here is working. This whip program we started last fall, and we're already seeing the deer keep coming down into where we're working to, to browse on the limbs that we're dropping and the apple trees. And uh, it's going to help to bring back the grouse, which uh, I, like, I enjoy hunting grouse, and it also helped the deer. More than three quarters of Vermont's forests and fields are owned by private landowners. So the quality of the state's wildlife habitat depends to a large degree on thousands of individual property owners. Educational workshops and programs like WIP are critical to maintaining healthy wildlife populations in Vermont. Working together, wildlife experts and landowners are making a difference. We're really doing a good job to 
keep the habitat growing and making it better. And I have habitat success stories fly in every day to me. Hey, I saw more deer here. I got my first bear. My son got his first deer. The stories are there and it, that's the ultimate reward. And you know, most landowners, 99% are very, very pleased with what we do. And we're seeing now landowners that signed up three to five years ago are reapplying to do additional work because they're so pleased with the habitat they're seeing out there. They're so pleased with everything that the program does. And word of mouth is really spreading, spreading our program around. Happy landowners, happy people, happy wildlife. For more information on this or any other Outdoor Journal segment, be sure to visit our website at vpt.org. Our site features video on demand, contact information, and links to related sites. You can call, write, or email us. And as always, we look forward to your comments and suggestions. This program has been made possible by a generous grant from the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, conserving our fish, wildlife, plants, and their habitats for all Vermonters to enjoy.